My guest in the studio today is a leading Czech specialist in cancer research, uh, Professor Jiri Neužil. Uh, welcome to the studio, Thank Professor you for Neužil. Having, thank you for having me. Um, Professor Neužil uh, has worked, has has actually under, undertaken research both in Australia and the Czech Republic. Uh, and you have concluded research on a substance, on a potential drug that is now in the phase of clinical testing. And if it proves effective on humans, on human patients, then it could really lead to a breakthrough in um, cancer research in the treatment of cancer, in particular in the treatment of breast cancer, which the research was primarily aimed at. So if I could ask you um, to tell us, uh, Professor Neugil, how this substance would work in simple terms and in what way it is different from what is already available. Well, um, that's a very nice introduction where you you gave here and um, not easy to answer in a short term, but I will, I will do my best. So. Um, the drug we have developed and which is being trialed now in humans in in this country in the Czech Republic is uh, working through mitochondria so we I don't want to go too technical but I have to say a few words which are sound a little bit um, technical if I may say so so mitochondria are tiny organelles in a cell which are responsible we can uh, perceive them as uh, some uh, micro power stations they produce energy the, the cell needs. And well, the problem with a cancer cell, that cancer cells have high level of plasticity. That means they can, they can change, they can mutate, uh, or they can switch off genes, they can switch on genes. And we try to um, hit a target which would be um, invariant in many types of cancer cells. And, without, and this target, with, if this is switched off, by our treatment, the cancer cell cannot uh, cannot uh, turn, go around it, and we will uh, is committed to die. So and these are mitochondria. So how are you targeting the mitochondria? Um, okay, so the drug we developed uh, is, uh, spe- is is a is a known compound. It's called tamoxifen. I guess many listeners would know that tamoxifen is um, one of the most frequently used uh, drugs against breast cancer. But there are types of breast cancer against which tamoxifen is inefficient. Now, um, we modify this compound in such a way that it accumulates in mitochondria. So you can imagine tamoxifen will be spread around the cell everywhere. Uh, this drug, which we developed, will accumulate in mitochondria where it causes a lot of damage. I don't, I don't, I don't want to go into detail because uh, this will be too complicated, but we we actually force by targeting mitochondria in cancer in cancer cells specifically selectively we force these cells to commit suicide so they die from within so this is the basically the approach we took if this substance or this potential drug i believe it is injected into the bloodstream is it not uh, yes how do you prevent uh, how do you prevent it damaging healthy cells yeah so Every compound, uh, even s- compounds which are selective for cancer cells, at some concentration can affect uh, non-cancerous cells, normal cells, normal tissues. <clears throat> However, in this case, we target mitochondria uh, on a, bas- a certain principle. Mitochondria in cancer cells differ from mitochondria in non-cancerous cells. And the principle of targeting mitochondria is such that this compound will preferentially accumulate in cancer cells compared to non-cancerous cells, I mean normal cells. In this way, we reach selectivity for cancer cells. And uh, again, I don't want to, I can't go into detail why uh, this is, because we would really get too technical. But basically the uh, mitochondria would damage the cancer cells and the tumor would what, melt, disappear? Um, Yeah, well, so uh, this drug, um, which accumulates in cancer cells, in mitochondrial cancer cells, causes generation of radicals, right, radicals. And these radicals trigger a a cascade of reactions which culminate in the death of the cancer cell. So these cancer cells will die from within, right? And um, 
this is a type of cell death which is very good because uh, these cancer cells which are dying are actually mopped up by cells of the immune system so they do not cause damage as they as they die as we said uh, it's now in the phase of clinical testing this substance you tested it on mice i believe is that right we in our laboratory we work with cells we, we maintain cells in certain way test drugs on cells and then if we find some uh, promising results then we get promising results then we go to mice so we have mice which in which we can uh, reproduce cancer human cancer and uh, in these uh, some types of my uh, cancer breast cancer which is difficult to treat very so i don't again i don't want to uh, get it about types subtypes of breast cancer which are intreatable non-treatable in humans when we reproduce these in mice this drug works very well so this gave us a big hope that if we go to humans eventually we may have a drug against this type of cancer which is very hard to treat now it's a long, long journey because I uh, have been, I don't want to be over optim. I'm, op I'm very optimistic, but I don't want to say we, ha we got it. Uh, I have to be careful because uh, although while I believe in this drug, it's a long, long journey. And what I want to say is there have been many experimental drugs which work very well against cancer in mouse models, but give it to humans, you don't get any effect. So it happened in past. The substance is now being uh, basically given to it's, it's in the phase of clinical testing yes. and and um, yes. human patients yes. are getting yes. it at a clinic in Prague. Yes. What are the results so far? Um, okay, so clinical trials are oh, clinical testing of a potential drug is a very long, a complicated process. There are phases: phase one, two, and three. Only after phase three, a drug can be registered for use by patients to be prescribed by oncologists and so on. We are at the beginning, this is phase one, and phase one has two stages, phase one A and phase one B. In phase one A, we give this drug to patients and uh, who are, um, uh, who are uh, meeting the inclusion criteria. So these are people who are after uh, oncological treatment, basically patients who are not treatable, for, for which only palliative care is available, who are going to die unfortunately so and we on these patients we test the toxicity whether this drug has any toxic effects on say immune system or, and so on and we we have cohorts of patients and with every cohort we we escalate the dose we give a higher dose and we at some stage and, and we may be reaching the so-called maximum tolerated dose where we will stop with phase 1a we go to phase 1b where we give the a selected dose which is non-toxic found in phase 1a uh, to patients for long term and again we look for at toxicity but at that stage in 1b we already could see some effect on the tumor the problem with testing of experimental drugs is that we cannot test these drugs on patients who are before a treatment because we cannot perceive a human patient as a, as an experimental um, entity like a mouse so we have to work with patients who are beyond treatment already which makes it harder about this is the way we how we have to go how soon if this drug is effective and say that a patient gets it in an early stage or how how soon would it work how and, soon there will be this drug do you have be... reason to believe that uh, the cancer wouldn't come back or... um well Okay, so in terms of uh, expectations, what kind of uh, time and how long it, it may take, um, this is hard and I can't, I may see, have some ideas, but I don't want to say any number in terms of years because it's dangerous. What I can say, it could be, if, our, if everything works fine, maybe five years, it could be much longer, it may never happen, right? So. This is very hard to say, and the other question was um, uh, last. Well, the question was um, how soon a patient yes. who uh, comes um, is treated at an mm -hmm. early stage would get rid of their cancer. Okay, um, I can't answer this because we don't know. But yeah, the question was whether the the drug, the cancer would come back. Now, again, this is a very tricky question to answer. We know 
from mouse experiment in mice. We have cohort of animals, a group of animals with a very hard to treat uh, type of breast cancer. Some of these uh, mice, not all, but some of them were completely cured. And after we stopped the treatment, we kept these, uh, these cured mice for half a year. And without any treatment, the tr cancer didn't come back. This is a very, very, um, uh, um, say, coarse approximation. Uh, a mouse lives for two years. So uh, six months of a life of a mouse is like 20 years of a life of a human. So if we would just based on this extrapolation, if we would then think if we have a patient who is six years old, has cancer, we cure this patient for next this patient hypothetically could be cancer free for the next 20 years. So it would live up to 80 years, which is the expect life expectancy anyway. That is, that is quite amazing. Um, now, the principle that you explained, um, getting mitochondria to actually damage the cancer cells, that seems to be quite a general principle. Uh, would it not work for other types of cancer? Why have you just targeted yes, breast cancer? Um, yes, um, this is something what we uh, are also keeping in mind. Um, we are, we believe we, maybe this drug, but we also work on other drugs which are still in the lab at this stage, uh, experimental drugs. So we think this could be, these agents, or some of them at least, could be broad spectrum anti-cancer drugs. So could work against a number of types of cancer. I don't say we have a magic bullet or something like that, but uh, the principle which we are pursuing, as you very well just said, uh, very correctly said, is uh, should be an in it should be um, common to many types of cancer, maybe to all types of cancer. However, there are other uh, features of cancer cells which may make may make this type of treatment harder or more or less efficient. What kind of interest has this research generated in the uh, medical community? Well, um, it's uh, at the beginning. Uh, there are, of course, um, uh, in medicals are interested in this. Uh, I've been invited to give talks about this. Uh, in, there is um, universities and uh, medical schools. Uh, of course, um, we are not the only uh, lab in the world who is trying to come up with a cancer, and the cancer drug, there are hundreds. Only in the USA, there are probably several hundred tr clinical trials or occurring as, as we speak. Um, the, our approach is different than many of those trials utilize. So we believe we have a bit of an edge here. Um, and another thing is that it's uh, the only one of the very few trials which occur in this country, which also makes it quite interesting. And um, I believe that uh, at some stage, if we succeed in this, uh, we would really achieve a goal. I mean, my my vision is to do uh, because we are a laboratory of basic science, mm -hmm. and so my vision is. A dream is to do world-class research, basic research, which will lead to a, a result which will save lives of humans. So this is my big, big vision and dream. What type of cancer would you be targeting next if it works? So breast cancer is the one which is occur, which we target now. Um, we are certainly not certain, but we are very interested in uh, pancreatic cancer which is completely incurable. It can be uh, surgically removed in some cases, but in most cases it is fatal. Um, we would like to look at um, brain cancer, which is called glioblastoma. This type of cancer is called glioblastoma. So these are, uh, we like the challenge. So we like the challenge and these are the challenging types of cancer. We don't, I mean, um, there are types of cancer which are relatively curable. Every cancer is bad. There's nothing like good cancer. All cancers are bad. Some are more bad. So we uh, we like the challenge, and we'd like to target those who are more bad or worse. I should say, I should say worse, right? So you already uh, spoke about this, but um, for those um, who may need this cure, uh, when would it be available at the earliest, if all goes according to plan? Five years. 
Well, which was 10 unlikely years. then five years uh, then five years because uh, um, we will finalize this phase one trial, um, phase one A trial. I mean, within maybe a month, within a month or two, we'll start phase one B, which can take uh, uh, a year. After that, everything goes all right, and we we also get, need funding for the next stage, phase two, which we do ourselves possi possibly with the local investors, or it has to be done by a um, a big pharma company like Roche, for example, or Pfizer, or one of these. In fact, there are not many companies around the whole world which can do this. You know, you can count them using your fingers. You know, there would be would be more. So. This is a really, really uh, expensive exercise. If uh, phase two can take a couple of years, phase three. In phase three, there are thousands of patients in different countries. In many, many it's a multi-centric um, clinical trial. There are a number of hospitals and uh, in different countries. So that can take several years too. Professor Nilgil, you have spent years working in the field of cancer research. Um, what is the most difficult thing about fighting cancer? Is it the fact that nature always seems to be a step ahead and look for a new way to bypass what yeah. you have achieved? Uh, exactly as you said, it's, uh, this is the biggest challenge that um, um, cancer cells are... Uh, I, when I, I, I give lecture, I lecture on cancer to my students at Griffith University in Australia, and uh, uh, I tell them that I perceive cancer as very smart in an ugly way, smart in an ugly way. So very smart cells which can um, always are ahead, a step ahead of researchers, let's say. So they have incredible um, plasticity. They can, you know, uh, uh, we take a tumor. A tumor has a region, sections of tumor, which have different mutations. And uh, we can maybe treat, part, or kill part of the tumor and a small part of the tumor will survive. Or, the, or some genes will switch or switch on. So this is the biggest challenge, to harness these changes and to find, to find what we call, we, we call the Achilles heel of cancer. To, and we are trying to find the Achilles heel. So where we hit there, the cancer cannot uh, recover anymore. And uh, it's very hard because there are so many features about cancer we are learning even now, right? I can tell you that, uh, say, it's, it sounds very grim, but this is the reality. There's a primary tumor in the body, there are metastases. The metastases are different than the primary tumor. So maybe you can, you can treat the primary tumor, but you may not be able to, to treat the metastases. And usually the patient dies anyway because, of metastas because the tumor starts to metastasize. So secondary tumors in distal parts of the body than where the primary tumor is located are, are forming. So there are lots of challenges. Uh, it's a fascinating world for scientists because the research we do is fascinating. I mean, I'm fascinated and my colleagues are and so on. But also um, the vision that we can achieve something for, for the mankind, if I may say so. It sounds very bold, but you know, for the mankind. But we can achieve something that's uh, really this um, big hope and, I mean, and would be bring us uh, immense happiness. Professor Nilgil, thank you so much for your time and for your good work and, and let's hope we see this drug on the market one day. Thank you very much for having me.